the Lord has given me the privilege of having jobs which make it difficult for me to keep my work life and my personal life separated. My job as a Logos Pro very much had me, as Mark Ward, invested heavily in the articles that I wrote. I couldn't write in some sort of detached, objective way. I had to talk about the Bible as a believer in the Bible, and people responded to that. When I was an academic editor at Lexham Press, also, my personal interests spilled over into the things that I was doing, and I asked to be able to do separate projects, like the authorized uh, book that came out in 2018, actually before I came on as an academic editor at Lexham Press, um, like the documentary that I did with Faith Life. And now that I am the editor of Bible Study Magazine, and it's been right at a year since I took over the editorship, I have been pouring myself into that kind of work as well. And once again, the cross-pollination keeps occurring. So stuff I work on for church or just in my own personal Bible study ends up appearing in my Word Nerd columns. Stuff that I do for the magazine is also spilling back over into my personal channel. And over the next couple of weeks, you are going to benefit, Lord willing, from that spillover. I recently did some interviews for Bible Study Magazine for our November-December 2021 cover story of major figures in Bible design and publishing. So each week on my personal channel, I'm going to release those interviews as videos, and then when the magazine issue comes out in the beginning of November, right around there, you'll get to read, if you subscribe to Bible Study Magazine, my assessment, trying to pull these interviews together. But I enjoyed them so much, I knew I would, that I wanted to record the entire interviews. Obviously, there's going to be tons of stuff in the interviews that don't make it into stuff that doesn't make it into the final 1500 word uh, cover story for Bible Study Magazine. By the way, I can contract out stories very easily, and if there are really great writers out there of pros who do good stuff on Bible Study, I want to know you, I want to get some more uh, folks like that into the pages of Bible Study Magazine. I'm really looking for good writers, and I'm pretty persnickety about it. But I let myself write this, not because I'm a good writer, but because I just could not assign to a contractor the task of talking to all these people that I find so interesting that I wanted to meet. You're going to meet Klaus Eric Krog of 2K Denmark, a Bible typesetting and design company. I don't know that that Bible design is all that they do, but that's all I see them do. They are just top notch, and they've taken the Bible design world by storm. We're going to I'm going to talk with Klaus Eric Krog, the, I believe, founder, I guess I didn't establish that, but pretty sure, founder of 2K Denmark, uh, in today's interview. And in coming weeks, you will get to talk to some other names, people that you may know or may not know, but all of whom have interesting and insightful stuff to say about Bible design and publishing. Now on to my talk with Klaus Eric Krog of 2K Denmark. Welcome to a little Bible Study Magazine-sponsored discussion with, you know what, I failed to ask in advance how to pronounce your name correctly, so I'm just going to have you introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Klaus. That's my first name, Klaus Erich Krog. And um, yeah, that's my family name. Uh, that's a little story to it, though. You might just have that right away. Uh, when we started the company, my wife and I, uh, 34 years ago, uh, we named it To Krog, which is uh, two of us and our surname, but starting um, um, exporting to the United States. Uh, to, to the United States, um, we thought we'd better change the name because um, we were suddenly called two crooks, and that sort of didn't align <laughs> very well with what we were planning to do. So uh, we changed the name to 2K Denmark, and that's where I'm still the president and CEO, and I'm very proud of all my employees helping me um, be a major deliverer of Bibles all over the world. So you've given us a hint there at the end of what 2K Denmark does. Is that what you've done the entire time? Bible typography and Bible design? When we started out, I said to my wife, this is going to be a very, very small company. Why? Because we're trying to achieve the very best we can every time we have an order. 
and we had had a lot of you know different orders like a, a logo for a local company or uh, we also did a lot of, of school books but we always tried to achieve the very best we we could offer for the any assignment and as it turned out um uh, we grew in size because as it seems the very best customer would like to pay for the supreme quality that we were trying to achieve and that's that's how we built the company on a on a belief that you only get one chance for a good solution so you better grab it so the most important thing we do is always the project the book the bible we are working on uh, it's always the most important thing so we try to achieve the very best result on every order and um, um you know starting a company it's uh, it's taking a chance and you'd rather have more small customer than a few bigger ones uh, be more stable uh, um but um as it turns out we are now uh, 95 percent bibles uh, that's what we do we do more well, than 200 bibles a year uh, for six continents in the world and uh, 46 countries. So that's that's how um, established we are in the uh, Bible market. Of course, our biggest market is the US, but we do have customers in 46 countries that we frequently help doing Bibles. 2K Denmark got onto my radar at some point in the past decade when I started seeing in the frontispieces of Bibles that little... Uh, mention of your company. And then it really gained a face when I went to the Bible Tech Conference sponsored by Faith Life back in 2015 and met two of your employees at the time, Thomas and Joe's. And we just really hit it off because right at that time, actually, I was there to deliver a lecture that is on YouTube, Why Bible Typography Matters. And we instantly gelled because we cared about the same stuff. But, you know, you talk about the success that you know, you've been able to have in uh, Bible design and around the world. I'd like to hear more about that, but I want to zoom back in time to the era in which I grew up, the 80s and 90s, and, you know, unless I'm missing something, pretty much all the Bibles that my parents owned that I can remember growing up were typographically ugly. (laughs) Some were just so ugly it was a sin. I'm sorry, but it's true. Can you tell me, from your decades-long perspective, what changed? Why do we have so many nice-looking Bibles today? Yeah, it sort of didn't change. It changed back. And so um, um, when we make um, a a new Bible, um, we would look at um, the translation. We would look at the um, publishing house. We would look at the, uh, the audience and so on. We'll try to make a design that sort of fits these, these criteria. But we will also, in our search, look in the stylistic history of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, sort of styles developing. Um, I um, used to be uh, as a, a part of the censorship in Danish universities uh, around design. And I can truly say that I know all the typographic rules for the last 500 years. And as it seems, we have had a growing curve of quality in Bibles for the last 450 years. But in 1960, it all stopped. It went completely uh, downhill. Why? because it, uh, we changed from printing in letterpress to printing in offset. That meant we stopped doing typesetting as we used to, but they started doing photo typesetting. And these machines, both the printing machines and the, um, uh, the typesetting machines were made from, I'm sure, very, very intelligent and clever um, um, engineering people, but they didn't know, have a, the first clue about typography. So what you've been seeing is actually sort of uh, forgetting what you learned for 450 years, starting on a fresh, forgetting what quality is, forgetting what um, readability is, forgetting that whatever you do when you make a Bible, you are have the stewardship of the Word of God. And so it shouldn't be taken lightly. I mean, we know that we create interfaces uh, to present the word of God, and uh, I, I, do, I'm, I, I don't know, but it, uh, by looking at the designs from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, it's not apparent that they had the same notion to to present the word of God. 
um, with the quiet authority to create respect of the content um, as we do. So sort of uh, um, what we have been able to add um, is, is this notion that you are creating an interface that's so important because it's an integrated part of people's lives and their connection to God. And, um, um, and um, uh, if we didn't have, had, if we haven't had that as an ambition, it's not likely that we've created the, the Bibles uh, that we have. And it's not likely that we kept on developing both quality and, and um, creativity to re create the base Bible interfaces. So I think it's, it, it's, of course, phototype setting gradually got better. And I can say now in uh, 2021 that we are on a higher level than they were in 1959. Uh, when they typeset the last uh, hot metal Bible uh, because of the, the quality of the programming and so um, um, it has turned much better. And also, um, I think that we are only a part of a wave of uh, acknowledging that you need to treat the Bible um, with all your creativity and all the respect that the text requires. I think it's it's it, it, it's within that spectrum. I see uh, the, the level of quality of Bibles racing very 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 fast in the last twenty years. So yes. it's began slowly. I made my first Bibles in the nineteen seventies, so just after the the, the catastrophe, uh, um, um, uh, and um, I made actually my first claim to fame was by a small Linotronic system with a screen this size, black with green letters, only codes, to be able to create a, a Bible in three versions, uh, different, uh, where a small, a medium, and a large, where uh, the typography was treated differently in the three sizes, but it kept the same text on every page. That's my sort of first claim to fame. Um, and where, I've, where I really, I was working at the time at the Norwegian Bible Society as a designer and production manager. And I think that was one of sort of the, um, the places where I acknowledge that here's a job that needs to be done. So to create better Bibles, also at the time I was involved in smuggling Bibles to Eastern Europe in the Soviet uh, times and uh, also to see how much it meant for people to actually get a Bible um, made me realize how how important and how how fragile sort of, uh, people become when they can't get hold of the yes. word of God, or they can't read it, or they're not motivated by the interface to do so. You know, uh, there's so much that you've said that I want to talk about, and I just have to mention now my family on my mother's side, specifically my maternal grandmother, is Norwegian and Swedish, Scandinavian, and actually we have a family Bible that is in Danish, and I know there's a relationship between Danish and Norwegian and Swedish, and I wish I knew, I know you know far better than I do what the relationship is, but my understanding was that my Norwegian and Swedish ancestors were able to read this Danish Bible, and it's from, I want to say, the 17th century. And its typography, as I recall from a good 15 years ago, having seen it, it's been a while, is superior to the typography that was used in the Bibles that I had growing up. In fact, I look back at some of those Bibles and I can't believe I was ever satisfied. It's like I can barely even look at them. I'm so repulsed right now. So I'm really grateful for your work and your explanation. One more thought, I did a paper at the Evangelical Theological Society it did not prove to be a popular draw for people, but it was on the history of Bible typography, and I selected this topic because I was just interested. I wanted uh, an excuse to dig into this. And if you go very all the way back to the beginning, Johann, Johannes Gutenberg's Bibles were unbelievably beautiful. It's like 
uh, you know, movable type printing springs into existence already unbelievably mature, having built on the tradition uh, that was itself mature of scribal habits. And it is just a travesty that, you know, technological advances actually, you know, shut out the typographers for a while and brought us these ugly Bibles. So I'm really grateful for your work. Uh, so it's not a continuous line of improving quality from Gutenberg and all the way up. It's not. It varies a lot. Uh, and it varies because typography varies with the stylistic history. And um, uh, so starting at the 1700th, uh, you would have a classicistic area where the typefaces also got very sort of uh, either vertical or, or horizontal and, and very black. And, 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 um, and so they're, they're not usable for, 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 for typesetting at all. And they still made Bibles. So they, you had have, have a period in the first half of the 1700s where the Bibles are not good. Um, 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 I think also uh, mentioning the uh, Gutenberg Bible, it's a very black lettered text. So it is a rock tour, which you, um, yes, uh, is this special um, um, uh, European typeface. Um, um, I read it and I enjoy it. Um, 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 I think it, uh, its quality has got lost somehow. After Times New Roman was the only typeface that you were typesetting Bibles with. And um, so it lost a lot because um, the heaviness of the letter actually is a part of the readability as well. It stays on the page. It doesn't move. It's, it's, it's right there. Um, so, so that's also a case. By the way, about Scandinavians, yes, we interread each other's languages. It's not a problem at all. And Danish and Norwegian is uh, basically the same language has been developed uh, or 450 years where it was the uh, one kingdom. Um, by the way, the first 800 words in English um, is Danish words, um, hair, or eye, or ear, ear. So you have all the same basic words. The first 800 basic words in English would be Danish anyhow. Uh, so we, we have shared the same language all over that North Sea area. Um, yeah, a Germanic uh, history there. Now, tell me about your your own background and training. What brought you into this field of Bible design and the design of Bible type? I was only thirteen when I designed my first my first typeface. Actually, I wanted to write Bob Dylan on my wall, and I thought, well, how do we write Bob Dylan on your wall? I thought, well, I'll start designing a typeface. And I did. And, you know, you don't need very many letters to write Bob Dylan. That's only a few. Uh, when I had those letters, it was more interesting to complete the full alphabet before. Uh, yeah, eventually, there was Bob Dylan on my wall. But I actually as, as, uh, designed my first typeface there. And I knew that the deep fascination I have with letters uh, arise from the fact that these... 27 abstracts can be put together into words, words that can carry through space and time what's most difficult or important or even holy. So you actually have this system of small abstracts being put together and suddenly be one of the most important invention in mankind. And uh, by realizing that, well, it was difficult not to continue. So I designed my first magazine when I was, I was 14. And it's, I, already, I always knew. I always knew that uh, typography and, and presenting, sort of being the lawyer of the reader by the center and vice versa. So that uh, intermediate role, uh, trying to enhance what's said by its presentation. That's always been my challenge. That story resonates with me so much. I was actually a graphic design major in college. And my concern at that time was not Bible design, but design for the church. I wanted churches to have beautiful materials, Christian publishers. You know, I didn't know where I was going to work. Uh, the Lord changed my direction and I've gone more into Bible teaching, but I've kept a design business, forward design on the side 
you know, sole proprietorship in the state of Washington now, and it's been about 15 or so years, just because I care. And I just can't stand it if I see a church website that is ugly, especially if it's a church that I would like people to go to. We all enjoy going to church most Sundays, some of us all Sunday, uh, all the Sundays. Why? Uh, well, mainly to hear the interpretation of the Word of God mirrored into the lives we all live. So that's how important it is, isn't it? And, um, and uh, that Word of God is the same if you read it or if it's read to you. Uh, so somehow the responsibility of being able to be just a small part of people reading more or enjoying more what they read in the Bible, I think is so inspiring. Uh, and and um, and um, now there's been a lot of focus on this, as you say, 10, 15 years ago, I had a difficult case to prove that this was important, but, but um, I think all major uh, publishing houses now realize how important uh, this motivated factor of a good readable text, a nice design, a nice paper, the right kind of binding for the price range you're in, uh, how important that is. And uh, if we've been a small part in, in bringing this forth, well, thank you for giving us that chance. Yeah. Now, good old uh, Australian theologian Michael Bird, who's a very humorous individual, had a video a couple years back called, I think, the Biblica Hipsterica or Hipsteria, where he was satirizing this new uh, awareness of how important the aesthetics of the you know, Bible type and design are. And I think he was playing mainly off of the work of Adam Lewis Green in Bibliotheca, this Kickstarter project about six years ago that really just hit the big time, just was massively more successful than he ever anticipated. And it, it, it was a part of bringing forth uh, the awareness of, of the Bible. You might discuss whether it was the right translation he used or whether it's a little bit, but, 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 but the impact it had in, in in, in the awareness of uh, different layouts, different designs of the Bible uh, has been huge. So, of course, I, I mean, as a believer in God's Word, I, I think it's more important that you have access to God's words than that they are laid out nicely. But that doesn't mean that laying them out nicely and choosing a, an appropriate typeface is unimportant. And I had the job at my church back in South Carolina before I moved out to Washington of trying to persuade everybody that Bible typography matters. I asked an assistant pastor, can I give a, a lecture on this to the entire church? And I did during a Sunday school time. And I had somebody tell me afterwards, a guy who's very technically minded, he worked in the sound booth. He said, Mark, I was prepared before your Why Bible Topography Matters uh, lecture. That's what he thought I was going to talk about, like levels of elevation in Bible lands, topography. He said, I was prepared to just fall asleep in the sound booth. But he said, I was on the edge of my seat. I never thought about this stuff. I got that from so many people. People who love the Bible, as soon as I was able to explain to them, you know what? Somebody actually sat down and had to think through, is every verse going to be its own paragraph or are you going to collect them into paragraphs? Are you going to include superscript numbers for the verses or not? Are you going to have footnote symbols and what will they look like? And where do you put that center column of references? And my church full of people who love the Bible came to see. This isn't just an obsession of postmodern, aesthetically minded people, or you know, the, the Romantic era where we're just all into beauty and art for its own sake. Th there's actually a triad here of truth and goodness that we already see in the Bible, but if you leave beauty out, you don't have the, the fullness of what God has created, that the beauty is actually part of the message. Now, I, I want to zoom in here, and because you know this far better than I do, just having lived this for all these years. You said it wasn't really a change so much as a recovery of a beautiful tradition that we've had in the past. I absolutely agree with you. But you said that 10 to 15 years ago, it was a harder sell with publishers that this is necessary. So what, what changed to make 
American and other publishers willing to listen to this guy in Denmark who's saying, pay me money to make a custom typeface for your Bibles? What, what changed in recent years? I think that the market changed. So uh, actually um, offering just a little bit more, and that's a fraction, that's not even a tenth of percentage in the life circle, economical life circle of a Bible, whether you spend, you know, one cent more per Bible, you could actually get a nice design instead of a, a lesser nice design. Uh, so, I, I mean, it, I mean, it has no uh, economical impact, the investment. Of course, you need to have it on your budget because it's some money. Yes, okay, it is. But if you look at the uh, the lifetime circle of a of a Bible design, it'll sell for so several uh, editions, and 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 you will earn the money back for sure. Um, so uh, the, the hard sell was not sort of convincing the, the small sum, the hard sell, or that created uh, a lesser hard sell was that it actually made sense in the eyes of the buyers and the readers. So suddenly, uh, a company like uh, um, Evangelical Bibles that sells, uh, you know, the, the the premium quality of Bibles in the U.S. Uh, we've made, by the way, all of their Bibles. Uh, we've designed and typed it all they ever published, and uh, we're proud of uh, being able to help them uh, get along. Uh, and that's a very nice business, I think. And um, uh, at least I think that all the other publishers think that as well. Um, so you would see a lot of publishing houses uh, having uh, handcrafted premium editions. Um, um, and I think that's a very, very nice move because uh, I'm sure that if, although people spend a little bit more money buying these luxury Bibles, uh, the pleasure they get of reading, and uh, the, the, the fulfillment of, of, of the Word of God read from a wonderful piece of, of, of uh, handcrafted book. Well, I, I, I mean, it belongs together. It's, it's, it, and, right. and in that sense, um, more people will go and, and spend uh, the extra $100 to get a premium quality Bible. And I think that's here to stay. That's not going to go away because the advantage is so much bigger than the money spent getting it. So, so, so uh, I see that staying on. But hopefully, this will also mirror downwards, uh, sort of. So your Pew Bible or your gives an award Bible, uh, which should look yes. like it, but never does because it's uh, the cheapest quality of paper and the poorest typography to make it fit into fused pages. I think it, it, it still we still have a way to go to, to have this understanding of quality uh, with the Bible interface dribble down to all the other editions. And we need to do that, I think. I, or I see sort of what I, where I want to put more emphasis is actually trying to convince the publishers that this very small percentage of the lifetime circle uh, economy of a Bible pays off even if it's, it's, it's the cheapest Bible you've got. Also, uh, being more aware that actually you can buy a paper for this price and that you can, that's a complete see-through. But you, if you spend 5% more, 2.5% more, you actually improve the quality dramatically. And you have to do that um, not because you earn less money, because I think you eventually will earn more money, uh, but you have to do that because you are steward, you're, you're, you're living a stewardship of the, of the Bible. And in that case, you have to take extra care. I mean, um, 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 otherwise you should choose another business if you, if you can't uh, um, respect uh, the, right. the content that much, that you take extra care. And 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 and, uh, and be more be careful of, of how you choose your take your decisions in in pursuing the very best quality in any price range of the buyer. Right. I, I'm so totally in agreement with you. And, you know, I have contacts in various places in the Bible publishing industry, like at Crossway, and I'm just about to interview for this same article. Uh, a cover story at Bible Study Magazine, a lady at uh, Zondervan, HarperCollins, who has worked on their beautiful Bible initiative, 
And I know these people care. They actually want the message of the Bible to get out. And that's what got me into interest in Bible typography. Yes, I was a graphic design major. And so I, I just love a beautiful typeface. And when I saw Lexicon by the Dutch designer Bram de Doos, um, in the 2008 ESV study Bible, I just swooned. I just, every letter is so perfect and the weight on the page in my estimation, it just, it fit the Bible so well. But my main interest was making sure people read the Bible with understanding. And so a lot of my work has been focused on, you know, Bible teaching and on helping people understand and use multiple Bible translations. Of course, I'm talking in an English-speaking context and we have so many. But I began to see also that people really were impacted negatively by the standard two-column, every verse a separate paragraph setting of, in my case, the New American Standard Bible, and I'm not knocking the Lockman Foundation, but it seemed to me that there were very few beautiful editions available of the New American Standard. We have some more now, but at that time, my church, large church full of people who love the Bible, was you know using the New American Standard Bible for preaching and teaching. A lot of people were carrying it, and I would look around in the pews and see every verse was a separate paragraph, and maybe they'd have a pilcrow symbol at the beginning of you know a paragraph, but you couldn't tell visually where are the breaks. You had to be thinking, okay, where's that pilcrow? And I, I don't even think people knew what that Pilcro meant. I, I began to see this is causing people to isolate the verse, which is a nearly totally arbitrary, you know, division of the text, which is absolutely not inspired. And it was tempting them to pull that verse, lift it out of the context, and read it all by itself, which caused all kinds of problems. So I'm going to tell a little more of my story, and then I want you to reflect on this and answer a question. I realized I just want to get rid of these verses uh, and paragra uh, you know, paragraphs and chapter breaks and, and create my own paragraph. So I built a, a Visual Basic uh, uh, code, what do they call that, macro in Microsoft Word called Passage Breakdown. And if I click a button, it would take pasted Bible text and remove everything that wasn't Bible text until it was all one big paragraph. Then I would go through and create my own paragraphs and I saw, and I would do hanging in dents, you know, for, uh, uh, for poetry. And I saw how much that helped me think through the, the meaning of the text at sort of a macro level. And then that in turn enlightened me at the micro level. And I wanted to have a Bible that was like this. And there was nothing until the Books of the Bible Project put out by, and at that time in the TNIV, by a guy named Christopher Smith and a team at, at Zondervan or Biblica, I guess it would have been, yeah, at that time the International Bible Society. It made some odd typographical choices. It used a sans serif font, which I found to be a little <laughs> alarming, but it was still, you know, other than that, it made, it made typographical choices that were based on doing the very best to use Western type conventions to convey the meaning and the structure of the biblical text. And I just loved it. And I bought a whole case of it and I made my friends, you know, uh, pay me uh, my cost to, to have these Bibles in their hands. And then out comes all these readers' Bibles after that in the ESV and other translations. So I was ahead of that curve and so happy that that has happened. Here, this is leading up to my question for you. Could you ever see the English-speaking church or the Danish-speaking church or any, you know, national group or I should say ethno-linguistic or just linguistic group of Christians moving from the versified editions of Scripture, which are now utterly traditional and assumed, over to readers' Bibles, sort of switching the current proportions. So instead of most Bibles being versified and a tiny amount that you only use at home being readers' Bibles, what if, could you ever see this happening? Most people in churches are using readers' Bibles and the pastor is preaching from one and you use the study Bibles with all the verse numbers and footnotes and stuff at home. Could that ever happen? Well, I don't. Uh, well, I, I, I think it's. I think we need more kinds of Bibles. Uh, so uh, I, I really see the need for a reading Bible that 
uh, uh, in, in, in very many cases would, would be um, not aligning with the uh, translators committee's markup of the text. So that would be sort of a, a bridge you have to cross uh, not taking care of, of, of what the translation committee for that certain translation have has put down, uh, which rules they put down for the presentation of the text. Um, that would be okay. I mean, uh, because uh, somehow, um, uh, although uh, the tra translations committee might be very well at, 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 at Greek or Hebrew, and they might be very well founded uh, theologically, they're probably not very well founded as Bible designers anyhow. So, and the choices they made is from what they've seen, not from what could be invented in the future. So, so uh, re realizing that um, on one side, on the other side, making sure that all translation uh, keeps their identity, their branding is also important. So you said, you talked about the NASPY, uh, uh, and of course, the, the, I do agree that uh, the NASPY edition um, uh, through the last 30 years have improved a lot lately. Uh, it took some time, uh, but lately it improved a lot. And um, and um, so thank you very much. But it, it's so important that the NASPY remains the NASPY in this transaction. And that's also why we've designed uh, uh, seven different type families for seven translations for the comfort print books from Harper Collins Christian, so that every Bible translation has its own identity, because I feel it's so important that that the readers feel at home in the Bible they read, and at home means that it's the translation that they have chosen. At the moment, not you can't switch, but you've chosen this translation. And if of all the different variations of this this Bible, it has it carries some branding value, some page value that actually help the people, the reader find themselves at home in the Bible. I think very many things have been achieved here. Now, to answering your question, can I see everybody? So in churches, moving to um, 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 a format of the Bible more, um, um, more um, like a reading Bible without chapter, verse numbers, single and, and, column. Um, yeah, maybe um, yeah, um, uh, in one column. Sure. I, I, uh, we are here to steward uh, the the Word of God, and and it doesn't change. The Word of God does, doesn't change with the design. The design is only there to uh, to to to. Um, to, to promote the word and promote the translation. Um, and I'm sure that um, uh, uh, that's one thing though, um, um, it's neat to say, well, now we shift to Mark uh, chapter three, verse four, and everybody can be on the same page uh, very quickly. Um, it's a little bit more difficult. Of course, you've got the page numbers, but um, if you find a page number, even though you have a spread to navigate in, and um, that navigation sort of um, it should be taken care of if you wanted to use it in church. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe this should be a print-on-demand solution where um, and, and, and a nice solution where you could print out whatever you want to talk about and uh, you had a sheet where the actual Bible texts came and then thank you very much without any uh, interruption or disturbance or cross references or footnotes or why not uh, without uh, chapter numbers and verse numbers so uh, yes actually yes to all of it but uh, I think there's an, an ambition to uh, People ask me sometimes, um, 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 what kind of Bible would you like to do yourself? I mean, if you were your own customer, which- means, That was my next question. Oh, there you go. Um, so, so and, and I can say, well, I'm sure it's not one. Um, um, we are very, very happy with all the Bibles we've made. Um, it's been an honor and a privilege to be a part of presenting the word of God. Um, some are very significant, some will be coming to market uh, this next half year um very uh, prominent things and um and we love working with them i already told you that we only have one ambition and that's to make the bible we are working on right now the best it can ever be 
And if you have a second ambition, that would be to that we even improve that for the next one. Um, so, 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 and and um, we two K Denmark basically delivers four things. So we deliver uh, type design, uh, and we are big. So we just made these eight font families of eight typefaces. So that's sixty four typefaces. Um, and that making us the biggest typeface uh, design company uh, probably in the world, at least in the US. Um, so we do type design. We do type design to achieve three things, basically. We want to achieve a better readability. We don't do unreadable Bibles, and we enhance the readability in our type design. I've been doing Bibles for 40 years. I do what I've always missed on the market. I, I sort of fill in the... Um, um, the errors and try to improve the interface of the Bible. So two, one, readability, two, aesthetics. We want to make sure that the Bible is presented with this gentle authority um, so that uh, it, uh, your reading, uh, I think that enhances the deep reading of the text. And three, we save pages. When we did the NIV uh, uh, typeface in the Comfort Print series, um, um, not only uh, uh, um, um, not only did we create a more readable Bible than they had, as a matter of fact, they also saved so many pages in their printing that they made back all the investments in less than a year. And when they produced that in two years, they, they made this press release saying, well, we've saved over 100 million pages. Um, oh. and, and then so at the same time, you know what? People uh, enjoy readable, beautiful, thin Bibles more than they enjoy heavy, thick, unreadable ones. Um, and right. surprise. So they sell more as well. Surprise. And they, uh -huh. the readers of the NIV and the other uh, Bible translations we've had the pleasure to create typefaces from, they feel themselves at home when they pick up a Bible. They don't right. need, need a sentence because you, I, I've always recognized typefaces by the, by the pattern they create on the page. By the color and the pattern, I can, uh, I can differentiate typefaces from each other and, and people can as well, especially when I read something as important for them as their Bible text. Then right. suddenly when you go to the shop, you don't have to look on the spine to see whether it's an NIV. You open the book and say, well, this is my Bible. Is it the size I want? Do I like the color? Fine, I buy it. And, and, and having that kind of feel, I, I think, uh, uh, makes more people read more than their Bibles and that changes lives. Secondly, we do design. And um, within the design, we always, we never copy ourselves. We always try to take design a bit further. So if you ask me uh, what kind of Bibles do we want to create, the next one and the next one and the next one. Actually, I think we had just started on a path where um, a lot of different uh, types of Bibles are still waiting out there to be realized. Then, of course, we do typesetting, and we do typesetting in a way that you actually create this pattern of uh, this color uh, that the, 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 the uh, fonts are capable of doing if you work carefully with it. But, uh, but you know, uh, doing a simple text Bible, it's not uncommon that we create 10, 23 different uh, test pages before we make our actual choice. And that's the, in the minute details of, uh, of the space between letters, the space between words, the, the letting between lines and so on. We keep on working with them until they're perfect. And that's our obligation in our typesetting. So you can, a lot of people that are in the business can tell whether we typeset it or not, because you would see this right. pattern of a, of a page when it's typeset by us. And, the, and then the fourth thing we create, uh, 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 Bible concepts. And that also aligns with what's the next Bible. Well, I don't know, but there's a lot of them out there, and we are uh, we're in this business to to show uh, how differently a Bible can be presented as an interface for its readers. So uh, it's not we are not here to achieve one goal. We are here to achieve. Uh, we are here to realize 
a constant development of new Bibles, new Bible projects. I do believe that Genesis 1 gives what theologians have often called a cultural mandate. Also, it's called a creation blessing. Be fruitful, multiply. He blessed them saying, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. Pressing God's world towards its ideal is the way one of my mentors put this. Um, uh, one of my favorite writers, Andy Crouch in Culture Making, talked about uncoiling the potential that God has placed in his creation. So the tradition of typography in Latin letter forms, I mean, we're talking about Roman type here, goes back centuries, millennia, and we've built and built and built. And what we're doing is building on the tradition that's handed to us and trying to improve it a little bit. And in your case, that meant recovering excellent parts of the tradition that had been obscured by some you know, erroneous directions that the Bible printing tradition went into. You're creating uh, you know, the, the next step in the tradition. And I'm so glad because I remember, I really remember moving from my King James Version, double columns, every verse a paragraph, to a contemporary translation that had a different set of typographical choices in it. Every verse was collected into paragraphs, and my conscience rebelled. I said, it said, you know, this can't be right. You know, that's not the way Bibles look. Well, that was a really bad tradition for me to get into. I had found my way into one of those hallways that was a dead end off the main tradition, and now I think I'm back in using Bibles like you've designed into the, the most healthy tradition of Roman Latin letter, letter form typography. I'm so grateful for that work that you've done. I know also back at least in 2015 uh, at the Bible Tech Conference, one of your employees at the time got me onto a digital Bible app that you were working on. And of course, I work for Faith Life, makers of Logos Bible software. I want everybody in the world to have Logos Bible software. More than that, I just want them to get the benefit of digital technology for Bible reading and study without leaving behind, again, some of these advances that we've made in, in Bible typography. What are some of the strengths and weaknesses of the codex form, you know, printed paper, the stuff that you're in day in and day out, strengths and weaknesses of the codex versus digital technology for Bible reading and study? What do you think? I think, still, I, I, I keep repeating myself. I think you should um, write Bible text on your wall. I think you should re write it on the pavement. I think you should uh, fill out any, any blank sp space by filling in uh, Bible text. I think it should be everywhere. I think, uh, you know, you should write it in the sky, with the aircraft, whatever. Uh, so, 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 uh, it's not only two, but we're looking at these two traditional ones, uh, more, one more traditional and the other digital. We, um, and Thomas uh, and I, have the ambition to create the very best Bible reading app available. And I think we did. Um, together with Tyndale House Publishing, we published the um, Life Application Study Bible uh, in a technology never seen. And we still have the technology for showing text uh, in the most beautiful way on 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 digital devices, uh, we were caught in a trap where we had uh, developed our software, spent a lot of money doing it, and selling you know the license at a, a one-time fee, and then uh, having to uh, update and maintain and uh, and storage uh, a lot of stuff. So uh, our model was simply not uh, economically liable. So we had to close down our app. And that was a very sad day when we had to do that. Uh, I still have the ambition, just as uh, wanted to make the most beautiful reading experience in the, uh, in the uh, printed Bibles. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, I haven't seen anything just remotely uh, as, as beautiful as a text layout on a screen than the Life Application Study Bible. And also, you might say that the very, very good work you version has done in presenting the Bible says three for a lot of people. And I, uh, the, 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 I, the, I, I'm very grateful that they took the initiative and they were able to convince 
the copyright owners to give away their text for free because I think it changes the world. But it also changes the way of business. Uh, you can't beat a, 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 that, that price point. I mean, for free is unbeatable as a price point. And I can't work with it because all my employees won't pay at least once a month. So, uh, so that's how things work. Uh, so al although we have the technology, uh, I think we lack the partner to go that way again. I think the Bible should out there should be out there. I think you should read it on your on your on your wristwatch or whatever. Uh, Create ties with the Bible text on to make sure that people read your tie and have this little encouragement. I mean, also there, I think we're only scratching the surface. I, I, I and I think somehow even 2K Denmark and myself can be rated lazy or in the sense that do we really create enough spaces to read the Bible text or are we just rel relaying on publishing houses to publish Bibles and or churches to preach every Sunday? I mean, uh, isn't this a lot bigger than we can see from there? Do, don't we have, and you mentioned Genesis, uh, don't, we, uh, don't we have an obligation um, having seen the lord uh, and the light um, how don't we have an obligation to even take that bible text much much further i, I we, we are only in the beginning of a development where bible text will um, recover more things for instance the soul of people but it needs to be out there it needs to be seen it needs to be read it needs to be read aloud it needs to be yeah very stimulating, and I'm grateful that as you're talking, I'm thinking of multiple companies and ministries that are getting the Bible out in all kinds of innovative ways. And although I'm partial to Logos Bible software and I myself use it primarily, I've always felt like just as in Bible type, in printed Bibles, competition and the existence of other businesses and ministries doing digital Bibles is a good thing. It forces everybody to keep upping their game. And I, one of the reasons I love Logos is that we have put um, some time and money into making the reading experience beautiful, even the style of the highlights. It's not just a yellow rectangle. It looks more like the pleasing, you know, uh, shape that you actually get with a real highlighter. And then the type itself, you know, we put some time and thought into it, but that doesn't mean that we ourselves can't improve. I like it also that in Logos, you're able to turn on and off various textual features. So if I just want to read the Bible text, I can get rid of headings, I can get rid of verse numbers and chapter numbers, or I can stick them all back in, all the footnotes, you know, whatever my reading purpose is for the moment. I'm glad that other people are also doing that sort of thing. Can I move us into answering a question? I think uh, anybody who's made it this far in what I find to be a fascinating discussion would want to know, um, can you tell me the eight Bible translations for which you've made typefaces? And can I start with one that I know is the answer? If anybody, if anybody is skeptical that your work at 2K Denmark is really as important as you clearly believe that it is, I challenge them to find a first edition printed net Bible, N-E-T, and look at the way the Bible type and the notes are laid out. Then get the one that is recent, that's put out by 2K Denmark. I mean, you, you all did the type design. Hold them up side by side. I'll see if I, when I do the video of this, I'll try to put them on the screen. The difference is unbelievable. You guys did a fantastic job. The Net Bible with all those notes is still readable and beautiful on every single page. Your work, I, my hat is completely off to you. So there's one translation, the, the Net Bible. You've mentioned some others. What are the other seven? I'd like to go chronological <laughs> on you. The first one, uh, by the way, uh, these eight uh, different type families uh, will 
uh, be presented in a book. Um, we are just finalizing the design, um, 200 page book, uh, where I tell about uh, the, um, uh, the inspiration, how I got the inspiration, what our references culturally is, and how we perceive the ambitions of the translation committee. And that's for the following translations. So the KJV, first one, uh, the NKJV, uh, next one, they uh, arise from the same little New Testamental book I found at St. Andrews University Library. Um, uh, and then the NIV, which is the open translation. It also also have an open typeface, a forthcoming typeface. Then you have both the NRSV uh, and uh, it, it sort of um, um, has a long tradition starting with the ASV, the first truly American translation. So it, it, I, I took the year 1900 as an inspiration for that one. Uh, the the, the um, NASB, uh, of course, is also one uh, where we took an, uh, an inscription in Aramaic from the year zero as the inspiration for that Bible. Um, uh, but then the net, that's that's a Venetian uh, 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 typeface. And then we have designed a Catholic typeface uh, for all Catholic Bibles uh, by Harper Collins Catholic Public Sang House. Uh, it's out now in, in, in an illustrated Bible that we've also designed. So I think that made eight, didn't it? So KDV, uh, K, KDV, NKDV, NIV. Uh, NET, uh, the, the NASB, NRSV, uh, the Catholic Bible, and which one am I forgetting? Oh, this hmm. is bad. Uh, <laughs> is it only seven? No, it's eight. No, it's seven. <laughs> seven. It's seven, actually. Ooh. We can correct this in the notes. We'll, uh, we can look it up and I'll get it in the. I usually say something. Uh, that's not <laughs> No, but it's seven. It's seven translations. Yes, seven. It's not eight. Well, that is the number of perfections. So I'm sorry you can't do any more. But there's more work to be done, isn't there? There is so much more work to be done. Um, uh, this book will be, will be released uh, September 29th at a, at a release party at the Museum of the Bible. Where I also oh, do fantastic. Lunch and Learn, lunch and learn uh, 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 talks. Uh, and by the way, the Bible, the Museum of the Bible also asked me to to make four talks, uh, second to fourth of December, over the topic, the um, the Bible handcraft. So how do you handcraft oh. Bibles all the way in the different sort of type design, design type setting and, 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 and uh, concept development. So there will be four days of talks there. Well, please do somehow get a review copy of that book out to our offices at Bible Study Magazine. And Klaus Eric Krogh, thank you so much, not just for your time in this interview, but for the heart that you've invested in Bible type and Bible design over now many decades. I only, you know, sort of slowly became aware of how often I was seeing 2K Denmark in the beginnings, you know, on the frontispiece of beautiful Bibles. I, you know, I cannot say you have single-handedly changed uh, the Bible type design industry, but if anybody has, it's you. You've done an incredible amount of work for the church, and I personally am very grateful. Thank you for your time, and thank you for that work very much it's been a pleasure talking to me and uh talking to you and um and, and thank you for inviting me it's been a pleasure thank you i hope you enjoyed that discussion with klaus eric krogh what a guy i mean he's sitting there in his garden in denmark with the birds chirping behind him describing the epic role he's played in the modern history of bible publishing i find myself just really grateful for his work i think that came out in the discussion Go to the 2K Denmark site. I've got the link in the show notes. Check out what they've done. Buy one of their beautiful Bibles that they've made. I recommend the Net Bible. If you don't have that one in print, the one they did is absolutely stupendous. Thank you for joining us.